Welcome. I'm Alan Mattiso of the Baker Institute, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome our audience today for a, a, um, a special event. Um, this, of course, is one of our series of uh, webinars, Baker Institute webinars, and uh, we are very fortunate today to have as our guest David Rundell, uh, who has written a quite remarkable book, which I'm holding here, called Vision or Mirage, Saudi Arabia at the Crossroads. Uh, David Rundell got his um, BA at uh, Colgate in economics. He has a, a master of philosophy in, in, um, in uh, Middle East studies from Oxford. Um, he was a, an American diplomat uh, for 30 years, 15 of those years in Saudi Arabia. He worked in the uh, consulate at Durham, he, he was in, uh, in Reda, Riyadh. Um, he was um, uh, head of the mission in, in the embassy. He's had a, a extensive experience. He retired um, from the Foreign Service in 2010. Uh, he became a consultant, um, had many uh, Saudi clients. In the last five years, he's been associated with um, a consulting firm called uh, Arabia Analytica. This book he wrote, as he told us before we came on, he wrote as a, a primer for American diplomats because the writing on Saudi Arabia is spotty. And so what David Rundell tried to do, and I think quite successfully did, was write a history of Saudi Arabia from its origins until today. It begins with uh, King Abdulaziz, the man who conquered uh, Saudi Arabia, who um, imposes authority on its diverse elements and who attained legitimacy by providing stability and security and material benefits for the people of Saudi Arabia, established a succession, a principle of succession, his, his sons uh, succeeded him in order. And the last of those sons is King Salman and uh, the crown prince uh, that the king appointed is his own son, Mohammed bin uh, Salman, uh, MBS, the first of the family of the grandsons to be in line for uh, the monarchy. The background, the historical background sets up the problem that uh, David Rundell addresses, which is the, the challenge the many challenges faced by Saudi Arabia today, unique challenges, and the way the monarchy is trying to address them, the opportunities and the threats that um, its responses uh, pose for the kingdom. This is not a book really for experts. I found it uh, a great general read. I learned something new on every page. And if you have any interest in Saudi Arabia at all, I'd recommend this book to you. So what's going to happen is this. Uh, David is uh, actually uh, in Dubai. It's nine o'clock there. So we're doubly grateful to you, David, for tuning in. David will talk for about a half hour about his book in Saudi Arabia, and then we're going to open it up to, to, for questions. So um, David, um, the digital podium belongs to you. Thank you very much for that warm and Introduction, uh, I appreciate it. Um, I think today I will talk about, I won't try and describe the whole book. I think I'll talk about three things. I'll talk about what is changing in Saudi Arabia. And I will talk about how this has affected stability in Saudi Arabia. And then the audience being Texans and oil men and women, uh, I will talk about how this affects the energy sector. So um, what has changed in Saudi Arabia? Well, the first thing that most people would be aware of are the social changes. And that really falls into two categories, those that are related specifically to gender equality, and then those which are just more general social changes. I think 
most people are aware of the fact that women were prohibited from driving in Saudi Arabia. Women had to wear a certain uh, attire. These things are changing. Women are now allowed to drive. Many women still choose to wear their conservative cloaks, which they call an abaya, but they're no longer chased by the religious police if they don't. Uh, but more importantly, what people may not recognize is that there was something called the guardianship regulations. This was a whole series of complicated regulations that meant a woman had to have permission from her guardian, who was usually her father or her husband. And if she wanted to put her children in school, if she wanted to open a bank account, if she wanted to travel overseas, if she wanted to have a cesarean delivery, all of these things required literally her husband or, or her father to sign off on. Those have almost entirely gone away. Uh, there are still a few of them left, but they're mostly uh, gone. Likewise, women were prohibited from working in many different fields of, uh, of employment. And with very few exceptions, those are all have been changed. So before women could not be lawyers, women could not be judges, women could not be engineers. And this is, this is I'm not talking about 100 years ago, I'm talking about five years ago. So these things have, have been abolished almost overnight. So there's been a lot of women couldn't, there were no gym classes for women. Now women have gym like, like boys, girls have the gym like boys. So um, the gender change has been quite dramatic. Um, I'll just give you one further example. It used to be that uh, women could not check into a hotel unaccompanied. Uh, now, I remember the first time I saw it, I was quite shocked myself. There were women check checking into a hotel by themselves. I mean, it's quite normal in America, but it was uh, revolutionary in Saudi Arabia. Although my mother, I have to say, told me when I mentioned that to her, she said, well, in 1950, uh, I couldn't check into a hotel as a single woman in New York City either. And I thought, really? Well, I we didn't know that. But so in some ways, they're not as far or they weren't as far behind as we might have thought. Uh, but gender is a big change. Then there have been a lot of other changes um, which don't specifically relate to gender. But for example, there used to be no movie theaters. Now, they have movie theaters. There used to be um, men and women had to be segregated in restaurants, or you, uh, that's not the case anymore. There used to be no uh, music. Now they have rock concerts. The religious police used to um, harass people on the street if they didn't go to prayer time. So that's all stopped. So those are some of the social changes. Um, and I went on with that to some extent because those have been profound. And the book is entitled Vision or Mirage, and the social changes are most definitely not a mirage. They are real and probably irreversible. Now let's look at the economic changes. The economic changes, they had three major problems that they wanted to diversify their economy away from oil. They wanted to balance their budget and they wanted to create jobs for Saudis. All of these things had been tried in the past with some success, but not much. Uh, they hired a large number of Western consultants to, come, to figure out how they could do this. They changed the administrative structure of their government to a considerable extent to make themselves more efficient. And they have begun to make some of these changes. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but for a couple of things which they've done, which have been quite successful and were again, quite revolutionary, were fiscal reforms. They, they began to impose taxes, which they had never done before. There were effectively no taxes in Saudi Arabia. Now there is a, a value added tax, so 15%. Uh, water, electricity, gasoline were essentially given away for free. Uh, that is ended. So the government's budget is, is in better shape than it would have been without these changes. Uh, they have begun to try and diversify their economy. Um, they did that into first into refining, then into petrochemicals. Now they're trying to do, they're doing quite well actually on mining. They have quite a lot of um, aluminum, they have bauxite and they also have phosphate, which they use to make fertilizer. So they're making some progress, but it's slow. Uh, it's not easy to diversify an economy that's been so heavily dependent on oil. And then the third area of change is political. 
Uh, and here the changes have been both good and to some extent not so good. Uh, in fact, to a considerable extent, not so good. Uh, the first positive change was, as we said in the introduction, they have managed to make the transition from the sons of the founding king to the first of his grandsons. This was not going to be easy. This was potentially a disaster waiting to happen, a real game of thrones. As long as when the old king died, he had 34 sons and they more or less passed the crown down amongst themselves. And pretty much everybody stayed happy at that system. But um, there were only 34 sons. There were over 500 grandsons and they all thought that they should be the next king. So who was gonna get that job was not obvious and it was potentially very destabilizing. And the King Salman engineered uh, the rise to power of Mohammed bin Salman and he effectively eliminated any opposition to him. So now it would be, it's quite unlikely that there will be any opposition to him. And so the crown will transition to the next generation smoothly. That was a big achievement. Uh, it's not always recognized as to just how badly wrong that could have gone and it didn't. The, the negative side though, is that the country has become more authoritarian um, in making this transition. Um, what had been a collegial consensus driven system became much more of a concentrated power, much more authoritarian. Um, fear became more prominent, uh, a feature in Saudi Arabia. So, and many of the sort of creeping democratization that King Abdullah, the previous king, had implemented, many of those things have been reversed. Um, he was giving more power to their parliament, that is kind of stopped. He was having municipal elections, that is not completely stopped, but they don't have much power anymore. So there are a few things that were moving in the democratization direction, which have more or less come to a standstill. So. Um, those are the changes which have taken place in Saudi Arabia. I'll talk just quickly about how that has affected stability. Saudi Arabia has been more stable than most people thought for a long time. Now, that is a result of really four, the stability of the kingdom stood on four legs. The first was the historic legitimacy that the family of the El Saud had because they created the country starting in 1900 and going on till about 1930, the old king was pretty much continuously in, at war. Uh, one battle after another until he eventually unified all of the cities and all of the tribes of what is today modern Saudi Arabia. That gave the family legitimacy. Uh, the second thing that he did was he established a system of succession so that after he died, there were no less than seven successions, uh, which went smoothly and quickly and peacefully. And again, in the Arab world, that is not all that common and that gave the monarchy legitimacy. He built a coalition of stakeholder groups that supported the monarchy. These groups were the tribes, the religious establishment, the merchant class, the modern middle class and technocrats, and the royal family itself, which has tens of thousands of members and is effectively a hereditary political party in a one party state. Uh, and then the final thing that he was able to do, and so he created this coalition and he balances, the monarchy balances the interests of those different stakeholders. They don't have elections where one guy wins and one guy loses, they have a king and he sort of does the adjustments of who's getting what on any given day. And they've done that quite successfully. Uh, the final thing is that they, they, just can, they provided effectively um, a competent government. And what does that mean? A competent government meant it kept the people safe, it's secure both internally and externally. Uh, they kept them out of foreign wars and they kept the domestic peace. Once again, comparing them to most countries in the Middle East, uh, that was a big deal. The Saudi people just have to look on their TV and they say, wow, we could be like Syria or we could be like Libya or we could be like Yemen. So they're quite grateful for the stability and security that they 
monarchy has brought them. The monarchy also brought them a profound economic development based on oil, uh, but no one could deny that the average Saudi is not much better off than his father or his grandfather were. And the final thing that they delivered was a, an Islamic based society, which is important to these people who are by and large very religious. Uh, and it brought social change at a gradual pace that most people found acceptable. And it was not a ca case of the royal family holding back people that were screaming for change. It was, in many cases, the royal family was actually pushing the people to move a little quicker than they wanted to. I'll give you one example of that, which was the introduction of girls' education. Uh, when that happened in the 1960s, it was like desegregation in the American South. There was violent protest. Uh, the king had to actually use the National Guard to hold open some of the schools where people didn't want girls going to school. So um, now there were people who did want it, absolutely, but there, were def there was definitely strong opposition. When they, had, uh, when they introduced television, there were riots in which people were actually killed uh, because they felt that television was immoral and shouldn't be allowed. So the kingdom has a very conservative population, uh, which is changing over time. But uh, should, just to be clear that the government was not usually, was not holding back the people. It was often pushing them. So um, that's, those are the four legs, if you will, of stability. Each of them has to some extent been eroded in, in recent years. And I'll get, just quickly run through that, that um, the fact that the old king created the country meant a lot to people in their 50s today and to their parents. If you're 25 years old, this is ancient history. This is sort of like George Washington. So you don't really relate to it in quite the same way. And you do not remember the poverty and the insecurity that existed in your grandfather's day. Uh, so that is less, less of a cohesive issue. It's, it provides less legitimacy. Um, the succession, um, as I said, is secure today, but it's less secure than it has been. And why is that? Because usually there is a king, a crown prince, and a what they call deputy crown prince, which is to say the number three guy. So there's usually, you know who the next three people are going to be, or the next two are going to be. Today, there is no number three guy. Um, they have not named a number three guy. It's difficult to know who that would be because the crown prince, when he became crown prince, was only 30 years old. And so to pick someone younger than him, they'd have to find somebody who was you know, still in college. So they haven't picked one. So there is what in business people might call key man risk in the sense that there's a lot riding on Mohammed bin Salman. If something happened to him, it's not obvious who the next king would be after him. And it's not obvious that his father has the physical or mental ability now that he had five years ago to engineer the, uh, who he would want to be the next person. So the succession is, is less clear than it might've been in the past. Um, all of the stakeholder groups have reasons to be angry about the changes that have happened in the, over the last couple of years, uh, with, with the possible exception of tribes, the religious people have seen their uh, power, their religious police have been eroded. They, they feel that they've lost influence. The businessmen are seeing subsidies, which they, they base their business model on have been eroded. Many, without going into a lot of detail, many of the um, perks that the royal family used to have, have been eliminated. Princes didn't used to have to pay their bills, now they do. Um, this was very popular amongst the average people, the fact that princes now have to pay their electric bill, uh, but it didn't make the princes too happy. So, and um, I think it was necessary to preserve the monarchy myself. I think you couldn't have thousands of princes not paying their bills for, for years while you're telling everybody else that their electric bill just tripled. So it was, an, it was inevitable they had to do that. Uh, but to make basically to start treating princes more like normal people. Uh, but that obviously didn't make the princes too happy. So all those groups have some reason to be upset. Um, likewise, the, the issue of competent government, um, the country is at war now for almost 60 years. They were almost never in a war, very briefly in the Gulf War. Uh, now they've been in a war for five years and they're not winning. So that is a problem for stability. 
Um, and likewise, while I would say 80% of the people in Saudi Arabia um, are happy with the social changes, there are probably 15 or 20% who think things have gone way too far, way too fast. Uh, there's probably 5% who think they should go even faster. Those people are a small minority, but there's a substantial number of people who are, are more conservative and, and the chance of some kind of an Iranian backlash uh, is, is not inconceivable. So those are some of the issues that affected uh, stability, why they were stable and why they're a little bit less stable today. Um, in terms, uh, we could talk for another five minutes on oil just briefly, uh, and then I think I've talked for half an hour. So briefly on oil, um, I don't want to talk to Texans and try and tell them about oil, really. Um, and I think you probably know a lot of this. Um, Saudi Arabia is Sometimes they're the largest oil producers, other times they are just the largest oil exporter, but they have a large reserve of oil. They have a deep interest in seeing that oil remains a major part of global energy mix for the foreseeable future. This makes them quite different than many other OPEC members. They are not trying to make as much money as fast as they can. They want a long-term interest in sustainable oil. This means they don't want the price of oil to be too high and they don't want the price of oil to be too unstable. They don't want it to be too high because they don't want people to start drilling in the Arctic or in the North Sea, which they did the last time they put the price up too high, or they don't want people to go and buy uh, the third uh, insulation layer for their house. So they, they want people to continue to use oil. Um, and they don't want to drive the global economy off the cliff into a recession because that will destroy demand as well. So they have, it's not because they like us, it's because their interests and our interests coincide. They want stable, reasonable oil prices that will continue to keep the world using their oil for the foreseeable future. Now, in order to do this, they provide a service. They are an extremely large producer. They are also an extremely low cost producer. Their average price of production is somewhere between three and $5 a barrel. Uh, it's easy to transport. They don't have to pipe it through mountains or over mountains or under oceans. They, it goes right into tankers very, very easily. Um, but, what makes them important is not the price of their oil or the volume of their oil, but the fact that they maintain a surplus. They maintain a surge capacity, which they define as the ability to bring on oil in 30 days and maintain it for 90 days. And they usually have about 2 million barrels a day of surge capacity. And they use that to balance the markets. And they use that for political reasons. If there's a strike in uh, Venezuela or if there's a an invasion in Iraq, or there's a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, or quite frankly, if the United States decides that we want to put an embargo on Iran and take their oil off the market, and we don't want prices to go through the roof, uh, we turn to the Saudis and they open the spigots. Or as in the case of most recently, when we wanted the price of oil to actually go back up, uh, the President Trump talked to the Saudis and they closed down the spigots then and, and reduced their production. But they use this ability, this is just to make it clear, this is not a commercial decision that they make. This is a political decision. It costs them literally tens of billions of dollars to drill all these wells and then to shut them in. No private oil company and no other country would drill hundreds of wells and then to shut them in and leave them there until they might need them someday. Uh, so that's a, that's a, function that they serve as a sort of as a central bank of um, oil. So um, I don't, I'm trying to think how to keep this quick. I, I guess the next thing to talk about, we could talk about the role of Russia, we could talk about the role of OPEC, we could talk about China, we, all of those are issues that you could talk about related to Saudi oil. But the one that I'd like to emphasize in the five minutes I have left 
is the view that somehow Saudi oil doesn't matter anymore. I hear that view expressed and it's to me quite alarming. It's a dangerous idea. It's, it's similar to the idea that when we get to Baghdad, people will be throwing roses in the street. Um, it's not correct. And it, believing it can lead us to make some serious mistakes. Um, and why do I say that Saudi oil is still important? Well, some people, one of the arguments I often hear is, well, whoever, um, first of all, they say that Saudi oil is not necessary because we are now independent. Well, to some extent, we are independent, but oil is traded on a global market. There is a, generally a global price. And unless we're going to put barriers so that we don't either export or import oil, American oil is going to be, American gasoline is going to reflect the global price. So if Saudi oil is taken off the market, there will be a global shortage. Uh, and that would affect prices in the United States. Even if we did become autarkic, even if we did say, right, we're just gonna live on our own oil and the rest of the world can do its own thing. And Saudi oil was taken off the market and the price went through the roof. It would put our trading partners into a deep recession, even if it didn't affect us and we would be affected by what happened to them. So that I think is the first argument you have to, I think people need to understand is that yes, well, we specifically in America may not need Saudi oil. Uh, Japan, our allies in Japan and our allies in Korea are still remain heavily dependent on it. So second point would be people tell me or some people will say, well, it doesn't really matter what happens to the government of Saudi Arabia because whoever is in charge there will still have to sell their oil. After all, even when ISIS took over the fields in Iraq, they continued to sell oil. So why should we worry about the stability of Saudi Arabia? Well, I think there are three reasons that you should worry about the stability of Saudi Arabia. The first is that in order to sell your oil, you have to produce it. And in order to produce it, you need political stability. If, you, if Saudi Arabia collapsed into a dozen Bedouin tribes fighting over oil wells, like what happened in Libya, uh, production would crash. And then whether we needed it or not, the rest of the world would be very much missing the 10 million barrels of Saudi oil that gets produced every day. So Venezuela is a good example of a, uh, Iraq. Iraq's a better example. Of when there was instability in Iraq, when there was instability in Libya, production collapsed. The second thing you need to do in order to produce your oil is you need to manage your fields and you need to invest. And here, um, Venezuela is a better example here and Iran is a good example here. Iran used to be able to produce 7 million barrels a day under the Shah. They would be lucky to produce half of that today because they've mismanaged their fields and because they have not invested. Same with Venezuela. Uh, when OPEC was founded, Venezuela could produce a million barrels a day. Now they're exporting, you know, 300,000. Saudi Arabia could produce a million barrels a day when OPEC started. And today they can produce, actually today they can produce 12 if they wanted to. Uh, and they're about to embark on a new project to increase it to 13 million if they wanted to. So how you manage your fields, it makes a big difference. And I don't think it's clear that any successor government to Saudi Arabia would would manage Aramco as well. Um, the second factor about the Saudi government that we that, uh, that I've alluded to or spoken directly about is that they play this role of a central bank. Somebody else who came and took over the Saudi government might very well not do that. Nobody else in the world does do that. So it's not automatic that, uh, that this buffer supply would be maintained by a subsequent different government in Saudi Arabia. And I think the final argument I would make about why it does matter uh, who is in control of the Saudi oil fields is that, and I ask people that when they, when they tell me, oh, well, don't worry, you know, even ISIS had to sell their oils. So, so whoever runs Saudi Arabia will still sell their oil. And to them, I say, really, you really would like to have ISIS owning Aramco? That would be, that would be really nice. Then think about what they'd do with all that money. They certainly wouldn't be supporting moderate uh, governments that we like Jordan or Morocco or Egypt, that, that, that which the Saudis bankrolled to a very significant degree to keep them uh, solvent and afloat. 
Uh, Oman is another one. Bahrain is another one. So the stability of the Middle East is to a considerable extent de de dependent on the uh, Saudi foreign aid, I guess is what you would call it. And you can't be sure that that would be forthcoming uh, if there were a different government in Saudi Arabia. So I think that those are some answers as to why we would be affected by a, a decline in Saudi oil production and why Saudi oil production might well be affected by um, a change in the government there. So. I think with that, I've spoken for 31 minutes, so I'll be happy to answer questions for another 31. Well, thanks, David, for that talk. Um, it provides our audience with a good sample of what's in the book and um, also uh, good reasons for why they might want to read it. So we're, we're grateful for, for your remarks. Um, well, let's uh, let's talk a little about American policy in uh, Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, I think it's fair to describe our policy under the Trump administration as unconditional support for this uh, for the Saudis, um, and this has um, provoked a lot of criticism in the United States about our policy. Um, one of the foundations of American foreign policy is to advance democracy and human rights. And as you describe in your book, um, these, uh, the Saudis don't rate very high um, uh, on that scale. Um, you yourself in the book warn against democracy in Saudi Arabia, because if we actually had it, the people who, who won might not be um, in the best interest of American security. Um, and far, as far as human rights are concerned, you describe the repression now uh, uh, ongoing in Saudi Arabia under, under um, MBS. And uh, of course, the most dramatic example of that repression um, is um, Jamal um, um, uh, uh, Khashoggi, who walked into an embassy in Turkey and never walked out. Um, the CIA found that uh, uh, MBS himself was um, responsible for the assassination and uh, the administration gave him a free pass. So the question is, how do you reconcile American principle with our support of an autocratic government? And are we betting on the wrong Saudi when we bet on MBS? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, very good questions. I mean, in some ways, that's the most important uh, question for the entire evening. Um, there is always a tension in foreign policy between your interests and your values. A exclusive focus on either one is problematic. If you abandon your values, you will have nothing worth defending. But if you abandon your interests, you will have nothing to protect your values with. So you need to find a balance between these two items. Now, the murder of Jamal Khashoggi was a crime. It needs to be, and I believe has been recognized as such, it needs to be punished and it needs to be made very clear that it should not happen again. I think those things go without being, that goes without saying. Uh, but it also goes without saying, I think that a replacement government in Saudi Arabia would not in all likelihood be the Canadian parliament. If the government in Saudi Arabia were replaced through an election, it would almost certainly be an Islamist government, uh, some form of the Muslim Brotherhood as took over in Egypt, as was elected in Palestine, uh, as almost as did get elected really in the early days of the Arab Spring in Yemen. Um, that's not because all the Saudis like those people, it's because they're the most organized politically they did win the municipal elections in Saudi Arabia, the town, they had town council elections and the people who won were the organized Islamic people in the cities, in the countryside tribal people tended to win. Um, the 
so I'm, I'm trying to think the um if the if the government were overthrown by violence then the winners would be some kind of jihadists like Al Qaeda. So in neither case, neither the Islamists nor the uh, jihadists would they share our values or our interests. So it's not in our interest to try and change the government of Saudi Arabia. Our own efforts to do that in Afghanistan and Iraq have not proven very successful. So I think we're better off trying to work with the people we have uh, at, than to try and change the government. Uh, and I also don't think, and I don't really think, I tend to agree with um, John Adams that when he said that we are the friend of liberty everywhere, but the champion only of our own, and we go not abroad looking for monsters to slay. And I think that's right. I think that uh, America needs, this is the personal opinion. I'm not, this is, uh, most of what I've told you tonight is straightforward fact, but tonight that's an opinion, but I don't think that it's our job to impose democracy. I don't think we've been very successful at it. Uh, quite frankly, if you, I think in some ways you could argue that it was somewhat, um, we made some of these places worse off than they had been before we got there. Uh, and we certainly didn't, um, improve things as we had hoped. So I think we should be very careful before we begin to make people changing their own government, changing their own system, the fulcrum for our own foreign policy engagement. Um, so I think I, that, that would be my answer to the question. I, Jamal Khashoggi should not have been killed. There's no doubt about that. What they did was wrong uh, and we need to hold them accountable. Uh, but we should, but that doesn't, that doesn't go to saying that we need to oh, try and overthrow the government of Saudi Arabia, which I think would probably wouldn't work and wouldn't be very helpful even if we did it. Well, I think um, related to this is the American policy regarding the war in Yemen. Um, around the same time that King Salman came to the throne, the Houthis, um, Shia uh, militia group rooted in a um, Shia population in the north, um, took advantage of the collapse of Yemen after the, the Arab Spring and um, went into Sana. And that alarmed the Saudis because um, there were connections between the Houthis and Iran. And um, in March of 2015, the Saudis uh, launched a war against the Houthis. Um, this was under the Obama administration. The Obama administration gave support to that war, even though the State Department warned that because of the targeting of civilians, um, the United States was perhaps complicit in war crimes. And under um, President Trump, our support expanded and the war, um, it's, it's not clear how many uh, people have died in Yemen of the 24 million people there. Some people say it's upward to 200,000 the uh, embargo uh, of the main port has um, cut off soup, food supplies. Uh, there is hunger, there's uh, famine, there's disease. It is regarded as a humanitarian catastrophe. And we've been dragged into it by the, um, by the Saudis. Um, we continue to back the war. And um, how do we get out? I mean, um, it's hurting us. It's a disaster for the Yemenis, and ultimately, it's not even good for the Saudis. So, what's the solution? <laughs> well, if I had the solution, I would uh, have begun my talk with that. You know, I don't know what the solution is. I can tell you what the problems are. Um, I think the solution has to be some kind of a negotiated solution, which at some point in time will require concessions on the part of both the Houthis and the Saudis and the Iranians. Now, how you get people to do that? Um, you know, we've been working on that for five years. Um, I think there are a couple of things I would say about the uh, war in Yemen. Um, I'll be quick here. Um, there are several analogies with the United States that you can use in talking about what happened to the Saudis in Yemen. The first one is the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Saudis view Iranians in Yemen as an existential threat, the same way we saw Soviet missiles in Cuba. It was, it was the, the idea that we can tell them, hey, you can't do this and you've got to stop, 
uh, they are, they're not going to listen. Okay. They view this as a very serious direct threat. They have, they understand that Yemen is their soft underbelly. They understand that in the sixties, the Egyptians sent 70,000 troops there to try and use Yemen to destabilize Saudi Arabia and that their arch enemy today, the Iranians is doing, are doing the same thing, which isn't to say that the Iranians, um, control the Houthis. They, that's a strange relationship. They don't, but they, are influential. The, uh, is the Revolutionary Guard are there. They are supplying them with weapons and training and money, and they would like to overthrow the Saudi government, and they would like to do it through Yemen. So they're not going to back off in, until that is somehow resolved. The second, and so that's an analogy with our own Cuban Missile Crisis, which we almost went to a war over. Um, a second analogy, I would argue, is that it's taking them a lot longer than they expected. I think they did expect that it would be quick, that they could get in and get out. Uh, again, they are not alone in having that problem. I don't believe we expected that we would be in Afghanistan 20 years after we started. So people make mistakes. They made a mistake, so did we. Um, and the final one, I think, is an analogy with Vietnam, is that they want to get out. They understand that there's no um, military. They can't win this war at a cost that they, that they can afford in a military way. But on the other hand, they don't wanna just walk away and leave it there for the Iranians and the Houthis. So I think they're gonna to have to find some way like we did in, Par in the Paris peace talks to find some kind of a negotiated solution. And hopefully we can help them do that. Uh, but the, the willingness of the Iranians to cooperate is, is key. And so, you, you know, unless you can get the Iranians to, to help, uh, that's not gonna be easy to, to end this war because I think, it's true that the Saudis are part are per perpetrators of this war. I mean, and the civilian casualties have many of them have been caused by Saudis, not because they're trying to target civilians, but largely because they're incompetent and they they do a lousy job of targeting. Um, but the Houthis are not angels either, and the Iranians are stirring the pot as well. So it's not just the Saudis that you can point the finger at in this case. Um, so I guess that's kind of my answer on, on Yemen. Um, again, I would say there's another, um, I, I would call it a myth that it constantly gets repeated. The idea that Mohammed bin Salman is a rash and irresponsible guy who took his country into war and started this war. Um, again, that's just a historical misreading of what actually happened. The planning for the war was begun before King Salman became king. And when the war began in April of 2015, Mohammed bin Salman was not the crown prince. He was not even the deputy crown prince. He was the defense minister. There was another crown prince. There was another guy who was the deputy crown prince, Saad al-Faisal, who was ill at the time, but had still been the foreign minister, the widely respected foreign minister for 40 years. He was still there. And the king is the one who made that decision. And let's be clear, the Obama administration and the government of Britain and the government of France and the United Nations Security Council all voted to support them. Uh, so it, the, the idea that this was just one you know, crazy 25 year old kid who just took his country to war is just historically misleading. So any event, I think those would be my comments on, uh, on Yemen. It needs a negotiated solution. That's not gonna be easy to obtain. Yeah, they've been trying one. Yeah, I mean, it's not easy because it's, it's the same that we had in Vietnam. Yeah. Once your opponent knows that you're trying to get out, he's not likely to make too many concessions. You remember what to happened to the, to the Paris Accords? I do. Um, well, that's a whole other story and people yeah. have different opinions. But um, and we've got the same problem with the Taliban now. I mean, they know we yeah. want to get out, right? Exactly. So, uh, right. Uh, so how are we gonna do that without looking like we're losing face? So the Saudis have the, very similar to our problem in Afghanistan. And I think it's also fair to say, and I don't mean to, I sound like I'm defending the Saudis, to some extent I am, I suppose. And that, you know, we've killed a lot of civilians with our drone strikes in uh, Afghanistan. We don't wanna talk about it too often, but that's happened more than once. And we know it's happened. Uh, so we're not the only people that make mistakes with their target. And I think they're worse than we are, but, we should hold ourselves to a higher standard as well. We've got some uh, audience questions here. Um, let's see, the first one says the, the um, uh, 
This one is actually from Ambassador Dirigian. Ah. He says, what are the consequences of Jamal Khashoggi's killing domestically and internationally? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, people may not want to hear this, but I was there when he was murdered, assassinated. Um, it was rather like the Ritz Carlton. The reaction within Saudi Arabia was very different than the reaction outside Saudi Arabia. The Ritz Carlton was immensely popular immensely popular in Saudi Arabia uh, because everyone said, wow, these guys were crooks. They should have been in jail years ago. Finally, somebody's holding them accountable for all the money they stole from us. That's the popular view. Uh, if you're one of the people that went into, got thrown in jail, you would argue that, well, I didn't do anything any different than everybody else was doing, so why am I in here? So there's different sides to the story, but it was popular. Um, I wouldn't say I met many people who were pleased that Jamal Khashoggi was killed. But on the other, and I, in fact, I don't think I heard anybody, maybe one or two people who said, yeah, he got what he deserved. Very few people said that. But people did think that at a time when the nation was at war, when Saudi, young Saudis were dying on the Yemeni border, he went to a foreign capital and began to denounce his own government. This is kind of like Tokyo Rose, or if you want Jane Fonda going to Hanoi. Um, that was not popular, okay? Nationalism, when the country's at war, nationalism rises up. And many people thought that what this guy was doing, going and writing articles in the Washington Post, denouncing his own government, and denouncing the crown prince who was at home quite popular, um, that. They didn't say, oh, he should have been killed, but there was less sympathy for him than you would think. Uh, or let's say that, 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 the, that happened in the West. And you asked, Ambassador Dirigian asks what happened in the West. I think, um, you know, this was a catastrophe. I, I can't imagine, I have not seen in my career um, an event that damaged a country's ability to conduct its relations more than this. It was a, it was a disaster, a complete disaster for the Saudis. I think they had, they are trying to make reforms. They are trying to move their country in a direction which we've been encouraging them to do for a long time, economically and socially. They have begun to promote a much more tolerant version of Islam than they had in the past. Uh, and all of that was pushed aside by this irresponsible act. So um, I think it's, it, and it will be a very long time until they are able to uh, put this behind them. Uh, perhaps, perhaps never. Uh, that said, I mean, it didn't, it didn't destroy the Saudi American relationship. Okay. I want to be clear about that. This, you know, I was in Saudi Arabia again on 9-11. So, I mean, this is not the same scale as 9-11 and it's probably not even the same scale as the 73 oil embargo, both of which were serious problems. And, I'll, and Ambassador Dirigian will know about this. There's another example of where the relationship almost fell apart, which is when the Saudis went and bought Chinese missiles. Uh, so ch Chinese ballistic missiles, which in, some people would say were nuclear capable. They, they didn't have nuclear weapons, but they could have been put on them. So um, there have been other instances where the relationship was very badly strained, uh, but this one's this one's up there near the top, and I don't think it'll it, it'll it'll be a while before it's uh, if a very long while before it's overcome. Okay, here's another one. What is the future of the Saudi relationship with Israel? And the uh, that's another one. I was, I was waiting for that one. <laughs> that's a good one. Especially Look, given um, recent normalization agreements in the Gulf. Yes, absolutely. Um, Saudi Arabia is a status quo power because it has a lot to lose. That is the end of the day. Why are the United States and Saudi Arabia partners? It's because we're both status quo powers, because we both like things the way they are, because we both like stability. The Saudis 
don't like things that rock the boat, whether it is Nasser and his Arab nationalism or bin Laden in his jihad or the Arab Spring, or quite frankly, the Arab-Israeli dispute, which they would like to see resolved. And they have tried on a number of occasions to resolve it. Both King Fahad and King Abdullah, when they were crown princes, put forward peace plans that pushed the Arabs further towards recognition of Israel than they had ever gone before. And the Saudis spent both political and financial capital to obtain those agreements. Um, now, today, things have changed from when King Abdullah made his initial peace plan and the Saudis are looking and they see the cost benefit of relationship of not having relations with Israel has changed. The opportunity cost has gone up. The price that they pay for not having trade, for not having technical cooperation, for not having security cooperation, for not having tourism and investment, the cost of those things to the economy of certainly of the UAE and uh, by extrapolation to the Saudis as well, eventually, uh, the, the cost of not having relationships has gone up. Likewise, the benefits, which were primarily psychic benefits of being part of the Arab nationalist movement, those have declined. And so here again, we see a generational split. Um, one comment I would have made earlier is that Mohammed bin Salman is the leader of his generation, but much of what he's doing is embracing the inevitable. And that is also true, I think, with relationships to um, Israel in that it's very clear, I've been, I've talked to a lot of Saudis about this, and it's very clear that there's a generational split. People who are over 50, certainly people who are over 60, they feel betrayed. They, they grew up with the Palestinian cause. They, they care deeply about it. The king is one of those people. Uh, people who are 30 don't care. I mean, they say, you know, I'd like to go to Tel Aviv. You know, I'd, 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 I'd like to do business with Israelis. I'd like to pray in Jerusalem. So they don't, and, and they also say, and again, this is something that, you know, you might not hear and you might be not happy to hear it, but there are many um, Saudis who think that the Palestinians were very ungrateful for the aid that they gave them. And they remind you that during the Gulf War, the Palestinians all cheered for Saddam Hussein, despite all the things that the Saudis had done for them or felt that they had done for them. Uh, and they also believe that the Palestinians have not done a very good job of negotiating for themselves. And that, you know, we, they would say that we cannot let them have a veto over our relations with another country indefinitely. And that the time has come for us to change that. So um, I think that you will see um, Saudi Arabia will eventually, um, and probably sooner than later, um, come around. Now, there are problems. The Saudis have a, have a problem right now, and I wouldn't want to underestimate that. I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, because as the custodian of the Holy Mosque and the, if you will, nominal leader of the Muslim world, they don't claim that they are the leader, but they have a special role. Um, that makes it difficult for them. Uh, and they have, this is a foreign policy question, they have right now, they have two conflicting, two groups are against them. The Iranians who lead a Shia bloc, if you will, and the Islamists who are associated with Turkey uh, as, the, as a power and the Muslim Brotherhood as an ideology. And those people would beat the Saudis over the head with a stick uh, if the Saudis recognized Israel today or did it before there was a consensus. So what I think is that the Saudis will work quietly to build a consensus. And when there is a consensus, they will, uh, they will move forward. Uh, but they will try to get that consensus uh, working. So hopefully that answered your question about, uh, about Israel. Well, we only have a few minutes left. Um... I'll just ask one quick question. Um, the fracking revolution has had geopolitical consequences. Um, Saudi Arabia can't look to the West anymore uh, for in, uh, increasing uh, their exports. China is now their biggest customer. They have increasingly close relations with China. What's the American government view of this developing relationship? Well, 
I think it's inevitable. I mean, we may not like it, uh, but the reality is that the Chinese are the Saudi's biggest customer now. Uh, and they are investing in petrochemical and refining projects in China, and they have an important relationship with China. Uh, and it hasn't, it's not a security relationship, although there are, um, you'd be surprised at some of this, the, um, I'll just give you one example. When the Iranians uh, attacked Abqaiq and severely damaged Saudi export capacity, the United States and the West and even the Russians all made it very clear to the Iranians who were ultimately responsible for this, that that was not a, um, a good idea and that they would not like to see that repeated. And I'm sure that that had some, and that if it happened again, there might be more dire consequences. And I'm sure that that had some impact. But the Chinese also went to the Iranians and said, you know, we're the only people buying your oil these days. And we're the only people who are still investing in fixing up your rundown refineries and petrochemical plants. And, you know, we get a lot of oil from Saudi Arabia and we don't really appreciate you blowing up half the Saudi's export capacity. So we'd appreciate it if you didn't do this again as well. And I think that that had an impact. So um, the Saudis do have a somewhat of a backhanded, if you will, security relationship with the um, Chinese and that the Chinese have influence in Tehran, which we probably don't. Um, as far as oil demand, yes, um, fracking shifted the supply curve for global oil. Uh, it will keep oil prices well below $120 a barrel for a long time. Will it put, put OPEC out of business? Will it, will it put Aramco out of business? No, it will not. Saudi production costs are very low. The last barrel of commercially produced oil on this planet will probably come out of Dahran. They will be the last one standing. Uh, so, um, and the other thing I guess I would just quickly mention is that um, I don't buy peak oil. I didn't buy peak oil when it was being, when the twilight and the desert people were promoting it and uh, that we were all going to reach a point where it would be no more production. That was proven to be a false. And I think the people, and I see people talking about this peak demand is supposed to happen in 2030. They haven't been to India. I was in India six months ago, eight months ago. Um, there are a lot of people there still riding bicycles and they're not going to be driving Teslas anytime soon. So uh, I think you're going to, you'll, you'll probably see a steady, a, leveling off of demand in the West, but I still think there's a lot of places in the, um, in the developing world where they're gonna to continue to see demand rise. And the other thing is, you know, that oil is not used just for motor transportation. Um, we effectively shut down the economy in the United States in April and March and oil, and oil production, I mean, oil consumption fell by 20%, only 20%, now, that's a lot. But it didn't go to zero. It didn't go anywhere near zero. After all the shutting down of our economy, we still only lost 20% of the demand for oil, which was a huge, as I say, for the, for the price shock. But 80% was still being used. So I think there will be demand for oil for a long time. Anyway, that's my personal view. But uh, I'll be interested to hear what the Houstonians all think. Well, you have to come down and visit us to, to get that view. I want to thank you for what has been a really interesting hour. I'd like again to show our audience your book, Vision or Mirage. And um, if you want to find out about Saudi Arabia, I'd suggest you buy this book on Amazon and you will, I think, I'd be pleased you did. So thank you, David. And um, that concludes our program. Well, good night to all of you. Thank you very much. Appreciated so, the opportunity to talk to you. Hope to see you sometime. Good. Bye-bye.